This is Dr. Mimi Lam from Metro Health Medical Center at Case Western Reserve University, and I would like to introduce you to the basics of a phenomenon called pressure natriuresis. Natriuresis means literally sodium in the urine. So this is the process by which the kidney responds to increased arterial pressure, often associated with increased extracellular fluid volume, by increasing the excretion of sodium and water so as to restore normal blood pressure. In order to understand this, first let's look at this basic formula of hemodynamics, which we sometimes refer to as the Ohm's Law of Hemodynamics. This says that the pressure gradient across a vascular bed is proportional to cardiac output and vascular resistance. In other words, the drop in mean arterial pressure across our vascular system from aorta to right atrium is proportional to cardiac output and total peripheral resistance. Cardiac output, in turn, is the product of heart rate and stroke volume. And stroke volume reflects extracellular fluid volume. So when extracellular volume increases, blood pressure tends to increase also. This higher pressure is transmitted throughout the vascular system, and the resulting increase in renal perfusion pressure sets in motion a series of events that helps to restore normal blood pressure and volume. There's a lot of discussion about the exact mechanism by which the kidney accomplishes pressure natriuresis. Basically, what happens is that the increase in renal perfusion pressure suppresses the synthesis of angiotensin II via the stretch receptors in afferent arterioles that control renin production. Higher intravascular volume means more afferent arteriolar stretch and less production of renin and therefore of angiotensin. This has two major effects. One is a change in starling forces in the peritubular capillaries. Since angiotensin's vasoconstrictive effect is primarily on the efferent arteriole of the glomerulus, lower levels of A2 dilate the efferent arteriole and allow increased flow into the peritubular capillaries, resulting in increased capillary perfusion pressure. The increase in capillary hydrostatic pressure and corresponding decrease in oncotic pressure oppose and inhibit reabsorption of filtrate from the proximal tubule, allowing more excretion of sodium and water in the urine. Another effect of the decrease in angiotensin is downregulation of both luminal sodium hydrogen antiporters and basolateral sodium potassium ATPase in the proximal tubule, resulting in less sodium reabsorption and more excretion. Increases in other local renal vasodilators, such as nitric oxide, prostaglandin E2, and kinins may also play a role in pressure natriuresis, and so may increased medullary blood flow in the capillary beds called the vasorecta. These capillary networks run alongside the loops of Henle and collect fluid and solute reabsorbed from the loops. Under conditions of volume expansion, these capillaries will be more full and have more flow through them. Like the peritubular capillaries that accompany the proximal tubules, these capillaries operate by starling forces, and so when they are more full, they too will have higher capillary hydrostatic pressure and lower oncotic pressure, both of which tend to oppose sodium and water reabsorption. So this is how pressure natriuresis works. And now we ask, what good is it, and why do we need it? Pressure natriuresis is the reason that normal people do not become hypertensive when they are salt and water loaded, for instance, with a high salt diet. In this diagram, you can see that a normal person maintains a pretty constant pressure, shown here by the white curve as mean arterial pressure. Blood pressure remains normal whether their salt intake is low, medium, or high. This is because pressure natriuresis helps them to increase sodium excretion to match intake and to maintain a normal intravascular volume and blood pressure at any level of sodium intake. In contrast, hypertensive people often have impaired pressure natriuresis, which can show up in a couple of different ways. In so-called salt-sensitive hypertension, 
a person is not able to normally excrete a salt load. In other words, they have impaired pressure natriuresis. The salt load thus remains in the vascular space accompanied by ingested water and results in elevated blood pressure that becomes worse as the amount of salt intake and retention increases. This type of hypertension can be seen, for instance, in patients with advanced chronic kidney disease, insulin-resistant diabetes, and genetically determined hypertension. Such patients respond at least somewhat to dietary sodium restriction. But in patients with so-called salt-resistant hypertension, the pressure natriuresis curve is reset and shifted to the right so that increased sodium excretion in response to increased arterial pressure still occurs, but it takes a higher pressure accomplished by more vasoconstriction to make that happen. Thus, the person's blood pressure is high at any level of salt intake due to the abnormally increased vascular resistance mediated by high levels of renin and angiotensin. This type of hypertension is seen, for instance, with renal artery stenosis. The take-home clinical points here are that pressure natriuresis helps us to restore and maintain a normal blood pressure when changes in ECF volume and arterial pressure occur, and abnormalities in pressure natriuresis play a role in many types of hypertension. And if you understand how this interesting renal phenomenon works, you should be in good shape to read more and understand why people become hypertensive and why we treat hypertension in the ways we do in order to help correct or compensate for abnormalities in pressure natriuresis and their consequences.